thank you very much. And uh, thanks to you, Director Santos, for joining us here this morning. Uh, the census is an essential decennial constitutional function insisted upon by the founders in designing a government of we the people. Um, and the census was conducted and designed in 2020 under the Trump administration, not under the Biden administration. And of course, as the chairman says, there's demographic movement in America, in a free society where people have a constitutional right to travel across state lines and to move. There's always demographic movement. The chairman suggests people are fleeing uh, taxes in the blue states. I know there are people fleeing uh, the anti-abortion restrictions in red states because um, is, uh, I, I met a lot of them uh, over Thanksgiving, actually, young women who don't want to live in the red states uh, under the new regime of uh, state legislative theocratic control over the bodies of women. But in any event, that's all part of the normal course of demographic movement. People, Americans can decide to live where they want to live. Now, the Bureau faced some giant and unprecedented challenges in conducting the 2020 census. It took place in the COVID-19 global pandemic, which significantly complicated the work of census staff as huge parts of the public were worried about contracting COVID-19. It severely affected the work of the census. Many census activities were suspended or shifted, and in many states and localities, lockdowns and travel restrictions stopped the Census Bureau from accessing entire communities and neighborhoods. A number of other problems caused by the pandemic further affected the count, such as double counting people who had temporarily moved in with their family or friends to try to survive the crisis, or college students being counted twice after being sent home from school mid-semester or not being counted at all if they were missed. Overcounts can occur when members of a family with a second home list their primary address in different ways or when a landlord lists a tenant as living in an apartment even if the tenant lists another residence as their primary address if they've gone to try to wait out the, the epidemic in a different place. Overcounts and undercounts are not a new problem. Uh, they are a traditional problem, a long-standing problem, as the GAO says, but there's always a new variety of challenges in different settings, and obviously the disastrous response of the federal government to COVID-19 deeply complicated the work of the Census Bureau. The Census also had to contend with hurricanes and wildfires affecting a number of different states, and it was conducted following limited tests because of substantial budget cuts that had taken place in the years before the census. There's no reason to see these undercounts and overcounts as anything more than the normal kinds of errors made during exceptionally difficult circumstances. But the usual profusion of conspiracy theories have proliferated from people not interested in making the census work better, but simply in scaring the public and dividing people along party lines. The post-enumeration survey is only intended to measure accuracy for a subset of the population. For example, it doesn't include people living in college dorms or people living in military barracks. Moreover, it draws its conclusions from a very small survey of 170,000 housing units out of 145 million in the country. In other words, the post-enumeration survey is a tool to help inform and guide future census activities. It is not a recount of the census, nor can it be or should it be used to supplant or alter actual census data for purposes of apportionment and distribution of government funds. I appreciate the chairman calling this hearing today because we should all want a complete and accurate 2030 census, but the solutions to achieve it are not really a mystery. Instead of cutting funding for the Bureau, as House Republicans have tried to do this year and years past, we need to make sure it has the resources it needs to conduct the planning and preparatory work that are essential to a truly successful count. Instead of threatening to add a citizenship question to the census, which experts have warned will depress participation, we should support the Census Bureau in fulfilling the clear mandate of counting the whole number of persons in each state set forth in the Constitution. The census must be an independent, non-political exercise conducted by statisticians and qualified professionals, not an arm of uh, the political office of whichever administration happens to be in charge. And we must ensure that the census never becomes 
uh, an authoritarian tool of fear and control, which is what it is in authoritarian societies. The census must always remain a tool to nourish and improve our democracy by empowering Americans through equal representation and equal access to resources and opportunity. The census plays a critical role in our democracy, guaranteeing there will be a fair allocation of House seats in the country and House districts of equal population within each state. It also assures that government resources and benefits will be distributed fairly. Um, it's not easy to count 334.9 million people in the world's greatest multiracial, multi-ethnic constitutional democracy, and the census must constantly improve its methods. This should be the grounds for analysis uh, and serious conversation, not partisan-motivated conspiracy theory and fear-mongering. Thank you, Director Santos, for your hard work, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for calling this meeting, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Today we are joined. I have reporting here on a letter from senior census officials at that time identifying, in fact, the opposite, attempted political interference of crucial aspects, technical aspects of the count, and political pressure to take shortcuts to make the count worse. Now, Director Santos, that aside, you are a nonpartisan member uh, of the government, but I do have a question. Is it accurate to say that the administration during President Trump's tre uh, presidency did push to try to cut the census short, a shorter timeline than typical, before uh, the count was completed? Uh, that's my understanding. So the count was cut short. President Trump decided to count uh, and decided to shorten that, that census count. And, you know, when we talk about um, areas that may have been undercounted, including some what we see now Republican-leaning areas, a lot of times those can, those can be rural areas, correct? Correct. So we have rural areas, and that oftentimes requires more time to accurately count. And to the chairman's question, having door-to-door -door canvassers in a rural area, it takes more time to canvass a rural area, correct? Correct. Because you have people who live miles apart, as opposed to an urban area where multiple people live in the same building, correct? Yes. So cutting a census short, when the Trump administration pushed to cut the census count short, he was hurting areas that were rural and happen, as we know, may vote with him. But that's separate from a political determination on the census, correct? Correct. So this brings me to what we often know as Hanlon's razor, which is to not ascribe to malice what can be more easily attributed to stupidity and a lack of proper governance. And when President Trump decided to cut the census short and make a decision that hurt his own political constituency, I don't think that that is something that can be ascribed to the nonpartisan public servants who simply have to carry out his own orders, correct? Okay, the post enumeration survey is a useful tool that produces estimates of these net undercounts and overcounts. Um, we know it's limited because it's a, a limited size sampling, as I said before. Um, it's not a redo of the census in any way. Um, and I know some of our colleagues actually sued to stop the Census Bureau from using sampling in apportionment decisions back in 1998. Um, and now today the suggestion is that this far more limited survey um, using a sampling method uh, is somehow more accurate in the census itself. What is more accurate, this technical sampling technique afterwards or the actual block-by-block -block census approach? Uh, well, that is an interesting question, uh, I, uh, Chairman, so thank you for asking that. Uh, you know, we spent $13.8 billion to do a complete enumeration. That has, uh, and we use the best science, the best methodology, the best people, et cetera. That uh, provides some credence as well as the independent expert reviews by national academies and such on the value and the accuracy and the fitness for use of the decennial census. The post-enumeration survey is designed not to estimate over or under counts, but to find where are the weaknesses and strengths in the methodologies that we use so that we can plan for a better uh, 
subsequent decennial Thank census. You, back. So I can be a someone who's from a foreign country, not a citizen. I just come over here and I move here, and I'm accounted to make decisions on behalf of the citizens of the United States. That is correct. Are illegals counted in the census, yes or no? Yes, if they're permanent residents, if they reside in the U.S. Okay, so when you're doing the census with folks and asking the question, you're asking them if, you're not asking that they're a citizen, you're asking, do you ask if they're a permanent resident? Uh, we ask folks to list everyone who lives at that residence. Okay, but you're saying you're only counting illegals if they're a permanent resident. Well, if they live at that residence. It, it, it's the interpretation of the so instructions. So your definition of, of permanent residence is that they live at a place yeah, uh, in the uh, U.S., at a U.S. address. Yes, I, I believe I misspoke because there's a legal oh, definition to permanent, yeah, to permanent okay. resident. It, it's someone who lives, usually lives at that address. So I'm going to ask the question again. Are illegal aliens, criminal illegal aliens, the people that break the law coming into our country when they enter in the door, to legal, door illegally, are they counted in the U.S. Census, yes or no? Yes. Mr. Santos, your directive comes from the Constitution of the United States. Is that correct? That is correct. So like the Postal Service, it's a mandated activity by the Constitution of the United States. Is that correct? That is correct. And the language in the Constitution says, does it not, that it, the census is to count every person in the United States. Is that correct? That is correct. It doesn't say resident. It says person. The Census Act includes... No, no. The Constitution. Okay. does Fair not enough. say resident. It says person. Is Whole that correct? Persons. Correct. It doesn't say American citizen. Is that correct? Correct. Um, why do you think the founders, in writing the Constitution, use that language? Why wouldn't they just say count every citizen? <clears throat> I, I am not a historian, Congressman, so I would leave that to others. Well, you want to speculate with me? I mean, wouldn't we want to know who's living in the United States, who's here, whether they're citizens or not? Might that not be a important piece of information? Our job is to do a complete enumeration, and we do that. But that's the mandate you've got, right? Correct. Right. So I was listening to the chairman, and he seemed to be suggesting we only ought to count American citizens. If I read the Constitution correctly, and I know my friend, the ranking member, is a constitutional scholar, if you want to change that, you've got to change the Constitution. You've got to amend the Constitution. What I don't get is in the federal government's nearly $1 trillion in assistance. So all of the people that work in this country, they send their hard-earned tax dollars here. Then we send back about a $1 trillion back to the states. I don't understand why my Republican colleagues would want states like Texas to get less help because of adding an unnecessary question. What I think I hear um, is some sort of conspiracy theory uh, that uh, Democrats want there to be more immigrants so that we can have uh, better shots in elections, which is just nuts. And frankly, uh, the people who have immigrated to this country and then decide to become citizens and are given a chance to become citizens, they actually listen to their leaders, just like any other voter, and they decide how to vote. Uh, there are plenty of people uh, in my district that vote for me or vote against me um, who were born in this country and who weren't born in this country. And I think that at the end of the day, it's so important for the American people to understand and hear that this idea of a citizenship question would undercount people, would result in fewer federal resources coming to places like Texas. So Texans on the Republican side that are for this bill are just basically saying, send your taxpayer dollars elsewhere. And third, it would take us back to a pre-Civil War reality, and that's just a shameful thing for the Republican. Texas added two seats. In 2020, according to the census, and we know that there was a significant undercount, um, specifically in Texas, for a combination of reasons, but we know that specifically Texas added 4 million people. Of those 4 million people, do you want to take a guess at how many were Anglos? Just a guess. I'd say a majority. Mm. 180,000. Mm. 
That's it, of 4 million. 95% of the people that were added, and we know that when it comes to minority populations, they tend to be undercounted. So get this, we added 4 million people. They were people of color. Texas got two new seats. So they took those black and brown and Asian bodies, and guess what? Do you think that we got a new black, brown, or Asian seat? Somehow, the way that they do their Republican math in the state of Texas, that amounted to two new white seats. Guess what? White Republican seats. We got two new Republican seats out of four million people of color. So I let, let me tell you, they, they love to use our bodies to, a, to apportion us in an inaccurate way. Crucial and critical. We're talking about uh, information that is used to determine uh, where and how, when we built roads or bridges, funding for schools that we see really need to be opened, and libraries, or deciding where to put fire departments or hospitals. The census data is the starting point for so much. Director Santos, is it true that the Federal Highway Administration, for instance, uses census data to decide which road and bridge improvements get prioritized? That is correct. Uh, what about low-income housing projects? Is it true that HUD uses census data to figure out where a project is going to be built? Correct. Uh, is it true that census data is used to make sure that the Voting Rights Act is enforced? Correct. Is it used to decide which areas get Title I grants for their schools? Yes. Or Medicaid, Medicare, SNAP, Pell Grants, the National School Lunch Program, all use the census data, census data correct? Correct. It's staggering, isn't it? A single form filled out by millions shapes 353 programs to provide 2.8 trillion in federal funding for communities across America. And that was in 2021 alone. 